Uh, there we go. So uh, we are going to be recording this so that people can review it in the future. If you, um, you know, you don't have to try to furiously take down notes, all this great stuff Esther is saying, you can just absorb it maybe uh, through listening slash, you know, people who are missing this can watch the recording. But um, but yeah, we're going to start with uh, Snowy Plover Natural History. So I'll probably um, turn it over to Esther. Let me stop sh my sharing. And then Esther should hopefully be able to share her screen. Let's see. So he's the first, first thing. There we go. Okay, now I can talk. Uh, where is the share screen? There it is now. Okay, give me just a second to pull no this problem. up. Yep, there we go. All right. So uh, we're here for our 2024 Snowy Plover Guardian Program. Um, quick agenda of what we're all going to get into for this ecology section. Um, we're going to talk about Snowy Plover ecology. We're going to talk about Monterey-specific info. We're going to talk a bit about... Um, the causes of decline of our plover population and then we'll get more specific into what our snowy plover guardian program does and is all about um, possible site and logistics for being a volunteer and then what our summer messaging will be um, so getting into the, plo the hey, snowy esther. plover esther, real quick, yeah esther i'm not sure your screen is being shared if you were reading off of a uh -huh. slide we were not seeing it well, let's try this again then. Uh, why is it? Oh, did I have to do one final thing? Yeah. Okay. Aha, we, um, I see a desktop. Yeah, that's a good start. <laughs> All right. Can you see it now? Yes. Maybe, perhaps. Yep. Okay. Um, give me just another. No second. worries. Sorry, I should have stopped you sooner. It's always like, no, no that is okay. I am glad you did. Are you? Uh, yep. Sorry, hold on. That's Everything okay. is. I can't see half the thing because yeah. there we go. Okay. Aha, there it goes. Thank you. Yep. Carry this on. Slide, <laughs> so you can ignore this. I already said everything. At least it wasn't an interesting slide. Um, so we're going to get into the snowy plover ecology. So to start off with some basics, the very basics of what a plover is. So late last year, um, a number of plover species had an update to their taxonomy and our snowy plover was one of them. So they switched genuses from Shiradrius to, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this, Anarancus. So now the Western snowy plover's scientific name is Anaronchus nevosus nevosus, which is much more of a handful to say than it was before. Um, and so they are a small little shorebird. I like to say that they're about the size of like a small tennis ball. Um, they have this pale tan on its back with a white stomach and face. And then during the breeding season, the males will develop this um, dark forehead, this really dark collar, and some dark spots behind the eyes. And so the Western snowy plover has been listed as federally protected threatened species under the Endangered Species Act since 1993. And they've been a species of special concern in California since 1978. Um, and the range, the, the plover's breeding range goes from Washington all the way down to Baja, California. So they've got a pretty wide range. Um, and that's shown in the um, light teal and blue color here on this little map. And many areas in the range have plovers present all year round, uh, including Monterey. We have a mix of plovers that like to migrate and those that like to stay during the winter season. And most of our breeding birds that do migrate for the winter, they still remain in California and they actually tend to go south. Um, they tend to go towards San Diego. We do have a few that go to San Francisco. Um, part of why we have so many year round 
residents that like to stay here and stay within California is because plovers really like to be in temperate latitudes. Um, a lot like us people um, and our migrating birds, they're going to start migrating back. Some have already started migrating back um, in March. Um, and some of our year round residents are already starting to pair up right now. And so we should have nests coming really soon. Um, and so plovers really like to stick to sandy beaches. Um, even though California has a lot of rocky coastline, the plovers are really specialists for sandy beaches. The adults, the eggs and the chicks all kind of blend in with their habitat. And plovers use beaches that have uh, sparse vegetation um, which luckily most of the Monterey beaches do have that sparse vegetation. They also have a low four dune. Um, we do have some areas that are uh, on our southern beaches that are really backed by tall steep bluffs. Looking at Fort Ord State Peach. Um, and uh, so being in open areas with sparse vegetation allows for plovers to look for predators and to keep an eye on their surroundings. And of course, they also need access to their food sources, which um, because plovers, they are a visual predator. They like to spot their prey, then run and grab it. In like, comparison to birds like sanderlings and sandpipers, which dig for prey, in the sand being a tactile predator. And so this means that plovers will go for things that are found on top of the sand, like um, beetles, kelp flies, amphipods, and other invertebrates. Um, and many of these invertebrates decompose kelp that wash up on the beach. And that's why we need to have this nice, healthy kelp forest off the coast, which can then wash up and they provide plovers with their food source. Um, so for the lifespan and survival, we've had a number of past studies done here in Monterey, and they found that males and female adult survival is give or take 70%. Um, the first winter, um, that first year of life is the hardest to survive, and so there's this wide range of 28 to 57% survival. But once they make it past that first year, they tend to live for a fairly decent long time. Um, the average lifespan is four years, but we do know that they can live a lot longer than that. Um, we do know of at least one male up in Humboldt County that has lived um, up to 18 years, but I think it's lived to 20 years. Um, not sure on that. <laughs> Um, their breeding season is also pretty long. It's a lot longer than the average bird species, and it lasts from March to uh, September. We tend to have early nests in Fort Ord Dune State Parks, um, and our earliest nesting attempt in history was um, in 2020 in mid-February. So I do know of one pair that I've been meaning to go and see if they have a nest on the ground at the south end of Fort Ord. So we may have a nest out there that I just haven't had the time to go and look at, <laughs> but hopefully we will see. Um, but this long season does allow for female plovers to have three successful nesting attempts. Um, and since the, this, uh, means that the last chick won't fledge until about September. So during this time, we've got like a six to seven month period of time where we have some very vulnerable chicks and eggs on the beach. Um, and the nests for the Western Snowy Plover, they're just this simple depression made in the sand. Um, this makes nests really susceptible to uh, possible predation and trampling. So plovers evolved uh, to camouflage their eggs and chicks to look very similar to their habitat. Um, both eggs and chicks have this speckled coloring. Um, the nests are usually three eggs and they'll hatch after 28 days of incubation. They're also, plovers are a serially polygamous species, which is really fun. So that means that each plover will have multiple mates throughout the breeding season. Um, and while both males and females will incubate nests, once the chicks hatch, it's all to the male and the female uh, just leaves to go find a new mate. 
Um, so she'll find a new male and just start all over again um, up until she gets that like third successful nest. Um, and then once the chicks are no longer reliant on the adult, the male will then also go and find a new female. And so for the chicks, the plovers, um, they have this synchronous hatching. So that means they all hatch really close to the same time. Um, and the chicks are also precocial, highly precocial. Um, so they're able to stand, run, and begin searching for food within just a few hours of hatching. They're also self-feeding. So the male doesn't have to feed them in any way. And what he does instead is he, he keeps an eye out and protects the chicks from predators. And he provides them warmth by brooding them since they're not very good at regulating their temperature. So they'd freeze at night if they were on their own. And after an additional roughly 28 days, uh, plover chicks are considered juveniles and that they've fledged. So they're old enough to um, regulate their own temperature, they can fly, and they're not reliant on their parents anymore. So we do see a good number of behaviors. Um, and if you go out and you look at plovers for a long period of time, you'll start identifying these behaviors. So roosting is just kind of like chilling. They're just sitting there or standing there, much like in this photo. They're not really doing anything. We also have incubating and brooding. And so that's when the adult is um, on top and sitting on top of the eggs or chicks and keeping them nice and warm. Um, we also have a lure display, which is when um, adult plovers are um, trying to lure a predator or just a person walking by to get away from their eggs or their chicks. And they're doing this like broken wing display kind of saying like, oh, woe is me, I'm injured. I am a juicy meal, you should eat me and we're going this way, uh, which is adorable. And also kind of um, when you're trying to monitor and you're just trying to get around them can be annoying because they are very dedicated to trying to lead you away from their chicks. Um, we also have foraging behavior, which is um, the plovers doing their visual predation, running around kind of like snapping and pecking at the kelp flies and beetles and bugs on the beach. So for our Monterey specific information, um, this figure shows uh, the snowy plover population in Monterey Bay from 1985, which is when Point Blue Conservation Science started to heavily monitor them. And it goes through last year. And we have our time, our years on the access, and the individual bars are the number of breeding adults that we had. And so it was a pretty low population um, when we started. And then it started to really increase in the 2000s when we had a lot of management actions happening um, and we were controlling for a non-native predator, the red foxes. Um, and we hit our population goal, which was um, 338. Um, but in around 2016, we started having this population decline, which is where we are right now. And so we've been having um, this, we've stayed under our population goal for the last five years. And we're really hopeful that we'll be seeing an increase in the population. Well, I'm really hopeful that we'll be seeing an increase in the population this year because we had a fairly good year last year. So we had um, 337 nesting attempts last year with a hatching rate of 62%. And we had a whopping 502 minimum chicks hatched. There's the possibility that we had a few more, but these are chicks that we visually confirmed hatched. And of those, we were able to band 320. Um, and this is double our usual amount of chicks. So we had a lot of chicks hatch. Um, and we also had 239 of those chicks survive to fledge age. And hopefully a fair number of them survived their first winter and will return to become breeding adults. Um, and so for our trends in hatch and fledge rates, so this is percentage. Um, you can see here with this blue line, our hatch rate was really, really good. Our fledge rate was okay, um, but these are percentages, so um, it's not overall numbers, it's just 
the average percentage. Um, so it was pretty good all around. But as for our causes of decline, habitat loss and degradation are the primary threats. Much of our ha their habitat has been taken up for um, beachside homes or hotels, um, and they're experiencing erosion, as well as having a lot of introduction of invasive plant species. So they're also removing the habitat by closing up all that space between vegetation. So like you, as you hopefully remember, our plovers really like this open sandy beach with sparse vegetation, letting them keep an eye on their surroundings. So our invasive species like European beach grass and ice plant just cause there to be no space for nesting to happen as well as just creating um, non-open area so they don't have a view of uh, potential predators. So because of the development um, and habitat loss, snowy plovers have actually become absent from more than 50% of all of their historic sites. We also, of course, have a lot of human use on our beaches, which can drastically change the landscape of a beach and how it's used by bird species. Um, there's a number of recreational activities that can disturb plovers. Um, and some disturb plovers more than others. Things like kite surfing can really look like avian predators from a plover's perspective. Um, and this can unnecessarily stress a plover out or cause them to move and no longer nest at a beach. Equestrian activity and jogging can run the risk of trampling nests and bringing dogs on the beach runs the risk of nests and chicks being harmed. Um, we have numerous documented nests that have been eaten by domestic dogs, as well as chicks that have been smothered by dogs, um, as well as just um, the sight of a dog can unnecessarily disturb a plover because it looks, a, a plover can't tell the difference between a domestic dog and a coyote. Um, so it, they just read it as a predator. And recreational activities on the beach, um, they can threaten plover nesting in multiple ways, and it can be either direct cause of nest loss or an indirect cause of loss for a plover to abandon their nest or abandon their nesting territory. Um, there are many non-native species of predators that were introduced into the coastal ecosystem and prey on plover nests and chicks. Red foxes were introduced for hunting and for fur farming, um, and they came, became very adapted to finding and consuming eggs. We also have a lot of native species that are predators, um, and they were always here being predators, but their populations have just become so enhanced by the proximity to coastal developments um, that their populations have just sort of exploded um, and crows and ravens are a great example of this. We also have some rarer species, um, which some of them are listed. So we have the peregrine falcon and the northern harrier. Um, I believe the peregrine falcon is formerly listed, but it can cause, or no, the northern harrier was formerly listed. Um, so this can cause some conflicts when, um, one of the species is preying, one species that was protected is preying on another protected species, and that can be a little difficult to uh, manage around. So many of these uh, predator populations, though, they've been just really increasing in recent years, um, which is often attributed to high levels of um, human recreation and nearby human development and the increased range sizes due to climate change, all of which can subsidize and increase the predator populations. So going into um, our snowy plover program and what State Parks does. Um, so some of the things that we do for um, during the breeding season to help protect snowy plovers in the Monterey district of state parks. We do um, a lot of trash management. So we cover, contain, and remove trash from plover habitat and the surrounding areas. We do habitat restoration of dune habitat to benefit plovers and um, other native species. 
We also do a lot of interpretation. We teach our park visitors about snowy plovers and our native dune ecosystems. We uh, will restrict special events like weddings or beach cleanups um, during the breeding season. And we partner with Point Blue Conservation Science to monitor our local plover population and to track the breeding success. We do um, predator control in partnership with US Fish and Wildlife. Um, and this is pretty targeted removal of animals that have been identified while we're out monitoring. We also install and remove uh, miles of symbolic fencing each year to protect our nesting and, hap and chick habitat. And this closes the upper portion of the beaches to public, public use. Um, of course, nests can still be found outside of our fencing, so we'll adjust them throughout the year as needed. And our chicks aren't really limited to where we place the fence, as our wildlife likes to go where they want. But this er interpretation part is really where our plover guardians come in at. Um, and so uh, we kind of define a snowy plover guardian as someone who can and will reach out to the public to inform them of park rules, provide interested individuals with information about beach habitat and beach inhabitants, and the importance of following the rules to protect these things. It's not someone who's going to be going out and monitoring um, or disturbing breeding plovers. And so it's really important to us that we don't cause more harm with this program to our breeding birds out there. And so the main roles of a plover guardian is to teach beachgoers about snowy plover ecology, um, to be tabling at beach access points, and to explain park rules and regulations with a little bit of particular focus on dog owner education. Um, and we also have some other opportunities like participating at tabling events. Um, and we're also open to, if you have a different idea that you want to try, we're open to, of course, allowing other opportunities to come up. So if you're like, want to do, uh, let's say social media uh, management, we're open to different ideas, <laughs> um, but we do have, a bunch of sites and logistics that um, are worth going over. Um, so our Plover Guardians focus the work at our six beaches um, within the Monterey District. Uh, plovers don't tend to nest at Carmel River State Beach, so it's kind of a low priority. And what we have here is um, highlighted our, our priorities for where we would have our plover guardians going to. So um, all of our beaches have visitors daily and the highlighted beaches are the ones that have um, a higher number of beach visitors and therefore a higher use for our plover guardians. Um, we'll go over some of our maps. So we do, this is Carmel River State Beach and we've got the Carmel Meadows access point and the Carmel River State Beach. Um, it's more of a wintering site. Um, so we don't put a lot of breeding use there. Um, still have a lot of dog use there. So it's not a bad spot to visit if you want to talk to a bunch of people. Um, for Bonneray State Beach, our two, we have three access points. Um, our two main focus part uh, access areas are the Seaside Lot and the West Bay Street. Um, we have two access points for Fort Ord Dunes State Park um, with the main uh, two beach access points. They're both um, equally high priority um, with the Stillwell access really close to CSUMB as well as the um, end of Lake Court, north end of State Park. Uh, Fort Ord State Parks access. Um, and then for Marina State Beach, we have Lake Court, as well as the main access area at Reservation Road. And then further north at our Salinas River, we have the three beach access, Malera, Potrero, and San Holt. And Moss Landing, we have um, a bunch of access here, um, three access 
three or is it four access points um and it's a really easy spot for people who um want to cover a large area this is really easy to for one or two people to cover and then Madowski just has one beach access point and so these are the primary rules to be aware of for the state parks um <laughs> do's and don'ts um so we do allow people to collect driftwood but we do want to discourage building driftwood structures um even though it's a common activity um and then we do allow equestrians and horses at Salinas River State Beach, Moss Landing State Beach, and Madowski State Beach. Um, we, they are supposed to be restricted to the wet sand when on the beach. And Salinas River State Beach has a designated dune trail that runs um, between Malera and the Petrero parking lots in the back dunes. What we don't allow ha to happen on our beaches, uh, we don't allow beach fires, um, we don't let anyone enter the closed areas or go beyond the fencing unless they have a permit, um, which basically means they're a plover biologist. <laughs> um, and we don't allow dogs or pets on the beach, with some exceptions being that um, leashed dogs are allowed at Carmel River State Beach and on the south side specifically of the Tides Hotel at Monterey State Beach. Um, and so if you happen to see someone starting to uh, leave from the south side and start going into the north side, then you can talk to them. But if they're on the south side or in front of the Tides Hotel, they're okay. We do have one exception to the dog rule and that is service animals. Um, so these are dogs that are trained to perform a specific task that is related to an individual's disability. And they're not emotional support animals and emotional support animals are unfortunately not given the same exception as service dogs. So service animals are usually very calm animals that remain close to their owners. Um, they may or may not be wearing a vest that announces what their status is. And this can sometimes make it difficult to tell or to know that an animal is performing a service until you're told. Um, they also don't need to be on leash if it would interfere with their tasks. Um, and uh, we are allowed to only allowed to ask two questions to determine if an animal is a service animal. And that is, is the animal required because of a disability? and what work or task has the animal been trained to perform? Um, personally, I prefer the second question when I'm talking to um, a potential service animal owner. Um, so uh, something to be aware of. Um, and we also want to make sure that safety is our top priority. Um, you should always be sure that someone knows where you are and to check in with that person at the end of your shift. Um, it's helpful to look at tide charts before you go um, and to know uh, what days you might change your monitoring to if the tides are too high. Um, other basic safe beach safety includes not turning your back on the ocean, which is um, very important right now when we're still kind of having some high tides and swells from winter storms. It'll be less important as uh, the tides go out and we get wider beaches, but um, that's still very important. We want to stay away from river breaches and mouths. Um, we want to drink a lot of water and wear sun protection. Um, and then if you don't feel safe approaching a person or a dog owner for whatever reason you don't have to approach you can just wait until you're in a safe place and then call dispatch um and then you can always feel empowered to end an interaction if you feel like it's getting heated or um it's becoming just they're not going to listen to you and it's not a safe situation um as for our uh summer messaging 
Um, we want to make sure people know that our birds are nesting and raising chicks. Um, so we want to make sure they're aware that plover nests and chicks are hard to see as stealth and camouflage are their primary defense against both people and predators. Um, plovers themselves can be very difficult to see as they blend in really well with the sand. Um, plovers, when they're incubating and they're staying very still, sometimes they can just look like a little piece of wood, so you wouldn't even know they're there. Um, and then even though chicks are highly mobile, they're, they can't fly until they're, they're um, 28 days old, so hiding and running, that's their only way of escaping. Uh, chicks will also freeze and just kind of like flatten out on the ground to just avoid detection. Um, the breeding season also includes um, all of our summer months, um, which is the most popular time for people to visit the beach. And uh, even though we put up fencing, we still occasionally get nests outside of our fenced areas. Um, and chicks are you know, highly mobile and they will move throughout the beach profile. Um, they can be seen uh, all the way down to the tide, but particularly down to the rock line um, as it's a popular feeding location. Um, and so our impacts of the illegal activities on clovers uh, for dogs, they can and will chase, catch and kill plover chicks. Um, they'll destroy nests and they can do so without the owner's awareness. Even really well-behaved dogs are perceived as predators by plovers um, and its presence on the beach can elicit, um, elicit a response and cause plovers to flush from nests, leave the area or perform lure displays. Um, entering into our closed areas um, increases the likelihood of eggs being trampled and can keep plovers away from their nests. Uh, if it goes on for too long or is repeated often, a plover may abandon their nest um, and can also make an area just completely unsuitable for nests. Beach fires will keep plovers off of nearby nests. Um, they also result from wood gathering, which have often happens inside of the closed areas, and this increases um, the risk of trampling or destroying a nest. The debris left behind can also attract, attract predators. Camping in plover habitat, um, it'll cause nest abandonment and make the site unsuitable for nesting and brood rearing, and can also attract predators. Um, and then trash and littering attracts predators, um, thanks to the food waste. Um, and so it can increase the predation risk. Along with the trash, it can um, subsidize predators and it attracts them into the plover habitat. It's basically um, an invitation for them to come in and prey on our nests and chicks. It also isn't a really good look um, and it causes pollution of plastics into our environment. We often also see um, beach toys, pet feces, and abandoned poop bags, and all of this can attract predators and uh, create an unsanitary beach. And so that is what I have. Um, and yeah, all of these things come together to uh, help us be more aware and protect our plovers. Excellent. Thanks so much, Esther. We had a question in the chat. I don't know if Sam, you found an answer to this, but you might know off the top of your head, Esther, Laura was asking, are service animals in training allowed on the beaches? Yeah. I, service dog in training. Yeah. I consider them to be allowed if they are currently doing the training. If they're just being a dog, then they're, yeah, they're not, yeah. yeah, they're not doing the work. But generally, um, a service dog, if they're in training, they're being trained to ignore distractions. And if they're being brought onto a beach where we blatantly say that dogs are not allowed to be, then they should be far enough in their training to um, act as a service dog. So, um, I, yeah, um, everyone that I've encountered where the owner has told me that they're a service dog in training has been acting as a service dog. Um, 
so yeah I would say they should be allowed um as long as they're actually performing tasks yeah which is the same as what we would say for a service dog yeah perfect excellent thank you so much for that um Lisa was also also yes. asking can you uh speak to why building forts the driftwood forts is prohibited yeah so it is one of those things it's um I would say personally if someone's building a fort it's not terrible as long as they actually take it down at the end the the main thing is that when people leave up a fort um that can really actually alter our dune habitat because of the sand build up onto fort structures as well as um can be a liability for the parks if they're left up because it could collapse on a person they are not always or even often soundly made yeah um, I, can, I can believe that yeah and so it is um also the forts are a perch structure for predators so yeah, oftentimes you'll get hawks and 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 um uh, owls and things just hanging out on there and we really don't want to provide them yeah a non-natural spot to just hang out gotcha excellent and, thanks so uh, much we're just gonna add oh, one more okay. thing to that too yeah. um a lot of times people will go to gather um wood for their structures in in the plover habitat oh yep mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah and so we don't necessarily want to encourage people going inside because there's often they'll be going for like a really long skinny poles and those will be inside the plover habitat yeah. versus if someone's just collecting like small pieces of driftwood those are usually found everywhere mm -hmm. um and then as for driftwood you'll often get people asking if they can collect it and they're like oh so i can like bring a truck on the beach and you're like no 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 <laughs> you can you can collect driftwood if you can carry it you can take it out because I've had people ask for like giant stumps and I'm like you're not going to be able to carry that under your own power um and we're not going to let you bring a tractor on the beach <laughs> so yeah. those are good good points to to make and, with people and actually country. sorry just one one more thing on the <laughs> yeah. um driftwood um yeah. so uh actually building the structures is not against any of the, yeah, yeah. the rules so you're Good. totally welcome people are welcome to do it um, we just try to discourage it um, yeah especially leaving it up at the end um, yeah I would say if you're actively catching someone just ask them to take it down afterwards they can destroy it at the end and that is perfectly fine it's mm -hmm. the keeping it up that's the problem gotcha uh, good, good right. questions yeah, yeah thanks everybody yeah questions. And we'll do more Q&A if you think of something else as we're going at the end. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again because we're going to head back over to the land of interpretation. We did um, natural history with Esther. So good. Now we're going to do interpretation overview. So this is, you know, how do we get everything, all the cool stuff Esther said, how do we communicate that with people? Uh, that might be trickier than you might think or realize um, or not. Uh, so interpretation, it's not, um, it's not interpreting languages. I honestly thought that when I first started in, in this field, um, interpretation is um, defined by the National Association of Interpretation as a purposeful approach to communication, facilitates meaningful, relevant, and inclusive experiences that deepen understanding, broaden perspectives, and inspire engagement with the world around us. And so that's a whole field you can go into within California state parks, national parks, at the aquarium, um, interpretation. It's just how do we, how do we convey ideas to people? And, um, and yeah, so it's again, um, kind of, uh, we're, we're helping to build that bridge, uh, between all the great information and all the stuff that Esther has in her brain. She's given it to us for our brain. We need to get that to other people. We need to build a bridge between our brains that's not a great metaphor, but um, maybe you'll remember it because that's weird. <laughs> but this is the golden rule basically right here for environmental education um, and interpretation. This is a classic quote that you've probably all heard, but it's actually uh, really powerful. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. We will understand only what we are taught we're not born with all this knowledge in our brains. We, a lot of us had to go where you, a lot of you are in school right now, learning all this cool stuff. So um, it's kind of important um, to kind of think of this as the golden rule, but also thinking about 
the other golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, you know, trying to be empathetic with somebody out in the field and just trying to trying to convey um, this information to them. And, you know, the, the plovers can't share their, their story. So that's what we have to do. We have to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. Um, and this is always a great, um, a great thing to kind of show just because uh, not only is it hard for the biologists to find the plovers, it's certainly going to be hard for the general public. They might not even see these guys, right? So if you're looking at the screen here, uh, how many plovers do you see? I'll give you a couple seconds. Feel free to put it in the chat or just keep it in your brain. I'm going to count. I don't know. How many do we got here? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But they really blend in. Just like Esther said, that's their whole strategy is to be cryptic and hidden. And um, it's hard to see them. So if it's hard for us to see them and we're looking for plovers, people who just pulled up from Fresno and they want to go play in the ocean, they might not see the plovers. <laughs> so um, uh, an important thing to remember, though, is that we are just doing interpretation. We are not enforcers. We're not rangers. So we cannot enforce the rules. So we have to try to convince people to follow the rules all on their own, um, just with our words and our actions. And so um, it's kind of a heavy lift. But if we do our job well, there's a really good chance that we're going to influence long-term behavioral changes with people we interact with. Um, and that's really helpful um, versus, you know, regulation and enforcement because the rangers can't be here 24-7 on the beaches. None of us can be here 24-7. We're basically trying to create like a cultural shift, <laughs> which obviously that's a big deal. Takes a long time, takes a lot of work. So, um, but if you can really, you know, convey this information in an engaging way, um, you know, show that you're you're passionate, but also you're you're wanting to, you know, hear from these people that you maybe are engaging with. Um, you know, you could really make make this um, connection with people. And so, like I said before, coming back to that golden rule idea, you know, everyone we're interacting with out on the beach is coming from a vastly different background. <laughs> so again, we might have, we all just sat in on this great, this great informational meeting from Esther. We know now about all this cool stuff about plover ecology. A lot of people don't know that. Some people maybe have never even looked at a bird or, you know, they just came out here and they're trying to de-stress from work or they have paid a lot of money to come out here to Monterey and they brought their dog on vacation, you know. So um, so everybody's kind of coming from a different a different angle. And that's important to remember. So we don't start right in with, you know, um, you're, you're, you're in violation of code, whatever. These are, are federally threatened species. You're disrupting the ecology. You know, there's a lot of jargon in this and that's not going to convey in helpful information to these folks. Um, so um, this is this is a pretty great um, stat to remember as well, that um, researchers estimate that on average, only two to 4% of depreciative behavior is malicious. So people breaking the rules, it's only about two to 4% that actually are doing it on purpose. Most people really just don't, don't know. And another part of interpretation, if you end up going kind of down this path or the more you hear from all of us talking about these these challenges with um, managing behavior at a state park um you know it's signage as well it's it's social media like Esther was suggesting there's all these different ways to try to get this information out because people just they just don't know and they can't make the right decisions if they don't have the information to make those decisions um so this is very helpful to keep in mind um if any of you have um, any of you, uh, um, you know, seasoned plover guardians, you, you all know, um, this is good to keep in mind on long days when it just seems like people don't care or they don't notice. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's just, um, it's just that people don't know <laughs> and all of us are already into birds or into nature. Not everybody's like that. Maybe we're kind of the oddballs. We want to get everybody in. We want more people need to care about nature and look at birds. Honestly, it's good for your brain makes you happy um but not everybody's at that level right so we have to try to be sympathetic to these folks and um try to you know understand where they're coming from and just kind of having that empathy when you first start out start out talking to someone so you know a good way to set yourself up with a good, to have a good interaction is a nice warm greeting introducing yourself hi my name's amanda how are you guys doing today Oh, it's such a great day you know weather you know all those great kind of a political you know small talk kind of topics you use at Thanksgiving dinners or whatever, start with that. 
that shouldn't make anybody mad. Um, identifying yourself as a volunteer with state parks, you're, or I'm with state parks. If you if you don't want to say you're a volunteer, you know, maybe the little, uh, what if they're a staff person, you can write a ticket. Sometimes that is helpful to have on your side. But, um, you know, can I answer any questions? It looks like you guys are, are observing the birds off in the water there. That's all I could think of. Birds. Um, I, could, I see you're you're reading our snowy plover signage. It takes a lot of work to put these signs up, and and you know there's a lot of great thought going into the content on this sign. Can I answer any more questions for you? Just trying to be friendly and um, approachable with people. Um, and again, more kind of little segues that you can use to try to um, like opening lines, basically. Yeah, what a gorgeous day. I don't know if you know, but <laughs> that's a classic. That's my go-to, maybe. Um, this is a good one for people flying drones, which um, I don't think are allowed at any of the parks, really. Um, I know they're not allowed at Point Lobos specifically, but um, it's a state natural reserve. I have to ask Esther about this one, maybe. Um, but anyways, it comes up a lot. Ha uh, drones are quite disruptive to nesting shorebirds. So you might say, have you seen that footage of a hawk attacking the drone? I saw that on YouTube the other day. It was kind of crazy. I never thought of birds seeing a drone as a predator, you know, just really being conversational about it. My, I like to take my dog to Carmel Beach. I'm pretty sure that's the only beach that you can have your dogs off leash at. Um, but when I come to this beach, I always leave them at home because dogs aren't allowed here. Again, you get, you can get the, you get, I love that breed of dog. That's my, that's a classic one too. Um, trying to explain to people about how the crows and the seagulls are going to steal their food. Again, we don't need to be feeding these subsidized predators that are then harming the plovers. Um, again, just trying to, trying to, in a very friendly way, get this message out to people, trying to get people to um, follow rules, uh, which are in place for their own good, really protecting the resources, but also in a lot of these cases for you know, the, the benefit of the, of the person recreating, um, especially the food one, <laughs> the seagulls will steal your picnic. Um, yeah. So the, these are just some nice opening lines that should try to be conversational and um, approachable with people. But yeah, a key thing is, again, uh, watch your tone. Um, what you say is important, but how you say it is also really critical. Um, again, this nice, like friendly kind of just, oh, we're just hanging out. Not that I came like, I came sprinting over from across the beach because I saw you breaking a rule. If it's like life or death plover stuff, um, maybe I'd go sprinting over. But a lot of times, you know, me running there is not going to stop this from happening, but it is going to set up a bad um, rapport with this family or something. So I try to really kind of meander, try to be friendly and make sure that it's like, um, you know, again, friendly and approachable and not sounding super um, shrill or um, scolding. Um, I've been on the receiving end of some of those when I first moved out here and didn't know rules. Again, you don't know what you don't know. And, um, and it makes, it doesn't make you want to follow the rules. It just makes you want to just get away or like, you know, it doesn't make you happy. You know, now, now nobody's happy at the beach. <laughs> There's two angry people now on this beach instead of, instead of people who now know more. So again, uh, key things, just try to remember that golden rule. Um, uh, but again, yeah, um, we're just educating the public. We're not enforcers. So if someone's breaking a rule, you can inform them of said rule, but there's no need to be like, you know, I'm going to turn you in, you know, try not to go on a power trip or anything. Um, you know, that's not going to help the situation. If someone pushes back, like Esther said, safety's number one. If anybody starts getting kind of weird, you feel like the situation's getting spooky, um, you just get out of there, you know, <laughs> you've got, you have no, um, we don't expect you to stay in a situation that's starting to even remotely feel awkward or weird that you're just like, mm, I'm not liking this. Um, you can get out of there. So your safety is paramount. Um, you know, and, and even though sometimes you, you want to, you want to work harder to talk to this person, someone's sometimes they're really trying to get away from you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And you really want to educate them more. I want to share my passion of plovers with you. Sometimes they don't want to hear it. You got to let them go, you know, practice some of your Zen, Zen meditation out there on the beach. Um, but always remember who's number one. I'm number one, y you know, safety first. You got to preserve and protect your physical health, but also your mental health. Um, sometimes people can be not wanting to hear the, our stories we want to tell or the, the rules we want to share. Um, but don't try not to take it personally. Um, uh, you don't want to make yourself like kind of depressed out on the beach because uh, <laughs> that can happen too. You're like seeing all this beauty 
and uh, people are just you know running roughshod all over this beautiful place um just know that you're doing good work and that you know you're you're working in your life to try to make a positive difference and that it does matter and um we have to be able to continue to do this good good work so don't don't get burned out um and you know you can always reach out to either um me or you know another plover guardian a friend just to you know talk about an experience whether it's just awkward and you're like oh I had an opportunity there and I flubbed it, you know, it could have been so much better <laughs> or something like that. Or, um, or man, that guy was just a jerk. Why do you have to be so mean to me? Um, you can always contact, contact me. I, I always like to talk through those situations. How could I've handled this differently? Is there something I could have done? Maybe that person was just having a bad day. There's nothing we could have done to make that a positive interaction. Um, but yeah, just again, taking care of your, of your mental health is super important. Um, anytime you're doing kind of um, public interaction stuff, just because you never, never know where things will go. And, um, uh, and it does, it does, it's kind of intimidating when you first start out, but we'll do like some trial runs and our training sessions and stuff. Uh, Cause it does kind of take practice to be able to, you know, get these talking points out super fast and have stickers and pictures at the ready to share with people. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll ease into it. And it's, um, and it is really fun when you do make those connections and some kid is like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Or, oh, look, it's so tiny. Or, you know, can we even see anything from this point? Hmm. Can't see a one. Um, it's really special and you could be making a really positive impact on someone's life. So those are those little, those little gems that, um, make it all worthwhile. So, um, basically, you know, and it sounds really cheesy, but, you know, wanting to volunteer in the community, wanting to protect these amazing birds, it comes from a place of, love and we want to try to you know convey that and emulate that in our public interactions because you know, a lot of folks they're out of the beach they could who knows where they come from where their background is they could be sad or tired or frustrated we all have this love going out into nature and it fills us up and makes us happy we can just attempt to get other people to feel that way too and maybe it'll make their lives better makes the plovers lives better for sure and uh then we're all one big happy family that's the dream, right? Um, but anyways, that's interpretation. And um, thank you so much again for sticking through it. And um, and yeah, again, I, I think interpretation really can be a fun kind of um, thing to learn more about. How, how do we how do we talk to people? It seems like it shouldn't be that hard, but it's tricky. It's tricky sometimes. So uh, you can always reach out. Yeah, if you have questions and. Uh, in-person trainings I'll be there as well so we can chat more about any of these topics um, but with that I'll stop sharing because now we get to go to logistics and paperwork with Sam thanks thanks Amanda I know yeah. I love um, the slide with all the different ways to start conversations oh thank you I, I seriously I use those all the time I always come yeah, back to them because it's helpful. Um, it, it helps a lot just going into those interactions with a kind mm -hmm. of a positive attitude. Yeah, good. it makes a difference so, for people. Yeah. All right, I'm going to. While you while you're pulling that up, uh, Sam, uh, Fred's got a, a something in the chat. Okay. Um, oh, he's asking about what about the other shorebirds that may be in harm's way at the beach. Um, yeah, you can always bring that up. You know, even though a lot of the um, like interpretive material we give you will be very plover focused because snowy plovers are. What's the Plover Guardian program after all? But you can always bring that up, especially um, in the fall and winter. If you're out at the beaches during the the non-breeding season, that's when a lot of the um, the migrating shorebirds are around. The sanderlings, the little white ones that run up and up and down the beach, they're trying to fly to Alaska. So communicating to people, you know, oh, that's why it's so important to have some of these beaches not have dogs. You know, these this poor little guy has to try to fly to Alaska on his own power. He needs to get sand crabs to fuel his migration. Sanderlings, Wimbrels, Godwits, they're all out there, but they don't nest around here. So there's all these amazing shorebirds that are impacted by these same activities that the plovers don't like. Um, that, yeah, you definitely can communicate that to people. It is um, uh, the greater ecology of the dune ecosystem is also fair game. If you're really into plants, there's all these endangered and threatened plants in the dunes. That, you know, another reason people need to stay on trail. Um, erosion and climate change and sea level rise are all topics that if you're passionate about, you know, those impact plovers, those are reasons people need to follow the rules at the beaches. And um, I always just, yeah, whatever kind of naturally crops up in conversation with people is a good thing. And then threading the theme of like, 
following the rules. They're in place for a reason. They're in a place to protect the resources, the, the plants and the birds and the, the vistas we love. Um, that's always like the theme in my brain. But good question, Fred. All right, I'll stop. Sam can go. All right. <laughs> um, okay, can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Excellent, excellent. All right, uh, hello everybody. My name is Sam Winter. Um, I'm a the Natural Resources Volunteer Coordinator uh, in the Monterey District. So I help kind of guide some of our volunteer programs. Um, and I'll be talking about all the, the fun stuff, the, the next steps, how to how to officially get started as a volunteer uh, with, with state parks. So, oops. Okay, so <laughs> I tried to put the whole timeline on one slide just to kind of get it uh, out here. So I know there's a lot going on here, um, but the kind of the, the takeaway is that our uh, Plover Guardian program really kind of tries to mirror um, the, the life cycle of the plover itself. So we, we kind of focus on the plover nesting season, um, which is, as Esther mentioned, is March through September. Um, but we do also work through uh, volunteer through the winter season. Um, and so you're welcome to volunteer for just the nesting season. If you want to stick around for the winter season, we'd love to have you. Um, but we do we do another kind of round of training um, for, for the winter season. Um, and so today, kind of the first step is, is coming to this, the, the virtual kickoff. So good job being here. Um, this will be recorded. So if you're watching this as a recording, good job watching the recording. Um, the next thing that we've got is uh, actually an in-person training. We've got two dates. One is uh, Saturday, March 16th. And then the second one is Friday, March 22nd. I believe they are both at 2 p.m., um, but we will send out more details about all of that um, after, this, uh, after this session. Um, we ask for everyone to try and get all of your, your paperwork um, and, and of course attending those, one of those trainings done um, sort of by right around the end of March um, because our goal is to have uh, a, a great squad of Plover Guardians out on the beaches uh, sort of right when the breeding season is starting. So kind of by, by end of March, uh, early April. Um, and so one of the things that we, we, we also will have um, is we, we call it our Plover Expert Shadowing. So we're not just going to give you these trainings and then, you, you know, goodbye, well, good luck. Um, we're, we're trying to kind of get you started off on the right foot. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to get you out there on the beach um, with somebody who is kind of an expert in Plover, uh, snowy Plovers. Um, and that might be somebody on our team with state parks. That might be someone from Point Blue Conservation Science. That might be somebody experienced as a Plover Guardian. Um, but we, we want to get you out there with somebody who's done this for a little bit so that you have a little bit of a chance to, to kind of see what that's like. Um, this year, too, we're going to try and, and um, even though that is pointing at May, <laughs> we're going to try and, and get a, uh, a check in with everybody, too, um, after you've been able to be out there for a little bit on your own and sort of just check in and make sure, OK, how's it going? You know, do you need any help um, with all those things? And of course, you're always welcome to call us at any time, but we're going to like track you down <laughs> in mid-June um, and, and, and check in. Um, we started in this last year. Amanda is a, a wonderful birder and a wonderful, wonderful interpreter um, and has, has graciously offered to, to lead a, a birding trip. So we're going to try to get a group out together and, and uh, go out and, and see some cool birds, um, not necessarily just snowy plover. But, um, and I don't know if we have anything picked out yet, but I think June 8th is the date we're looking at. Um, so you can look forward to that. It's, it should be a fun time. Um, and then two, also last year we started off started doing kind of an end of season wrap up event. So Esther will come in and present on all of the cool science and data and, you know, how did the birds do this year? You know, um, hopefully we'll at least have some preliminary numbers on that. Um, and last year we did it at Asilomar and had kind of a little bit of a, a, a potluck uh, food thing going. So um, look forward to that too. And then at the end of, uh, of kind of the season, um, we'll, we'll start again and we'll have another window of, of trainings and um, kind of a uh, opportunity to talk about um, maybe some overwintering messaging. Um, you know, we we focus a little bit more at Carmel River State Beach during the winter because we've got a lot of overwintering birds there. Um, so just, you know, we'll have an, kind of another uh, a training that happens then. Okay, so um, here are sort of, here's the steps <laughs> kind of laid out more on a list form. So the first thing is uh, we've got this virtual kickoff meeting. Um, so good job being here. 
Um, at the end of this meeting, I'm going to ask everybody to please take uh, our, our kind of pre-program survey. Um, so that'll that'll be just a way for us to kind of get a little bit to know you a little bit, um, learn a little bit about, you know, maybe when you're available. Um, and we're going to maybe help you try to pair up with some people so you're not out there on the beach by yourself. Um, some of that information. Um, there'll be a link to it later. Um, if you're watching this as a recording, I think I'll also hopefully you'll have a PDF so you can just click on that link. Um, when I don't know if, if Esther or Amanda, you have a way to get that link and put it in the chat, maybe. Um, that would be awesome. Um, so do do take that pre-program survey. Uh, the second part is going to be uh, completing a volunteer application through the website Better Impact, which is how we log all of our volunteer hours in the state park system. Um, and then we'll have a actual like a paperwork packet. Um, most of it now is through DocuSign, which is great. But there are a few things that we actually do have to have you scan or, or um, in or, or send in in person. Unfortunately, we can't do DocuSign. Um, there is a, a live scan background check. So with a fingerprinting uh, process that happens, um, anybody who's kind of interacting with the public uh, does have to go through that. Um, we have two sort of short online virtual trainings. Um, one is, is, is called Bear in Mind. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then new this year, there's like a 10, 15 minute Cal OSHA uh, kind of COVID requirement training. Um, so I know some of you have already probably done that, but um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, of course, we have our in-person trainings, um, two opportunities. We'll, we'll meet together, go into depth about a lot of the stuff that Esther covered. Um, we'll talk about some other strategies. We'll practice, you know, talking to each other. Um, we'll usually we'll try to bring in a lifeguard or a ranger, um, and, and they can talk about some of their experiences. And, and really, it's a good opportunity to kind of meet each other um, and, and talk about uh, kind of this whole program together. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, too. Um, and then finally, you know, I mentioned the plover expert shadowing. So we'll try to get you out on the beach with somebody who's who's done this before. Okay, virtual kickoff meeting. Good job. If you haven't yet, please sign in to the comments with your, your full name and your email address so we can get in touch with you. Um, and again, take the pre-season survey, which hopefully will be in the chat. Um, and if you're watching this as recording, uh, please send us an email when you finish so that we know that you've watched uh, this, this part of the training, part of the process. Um, and again, send us your name and your email and take that survey. So if you're watching this as a recording, you should do those things too. Okay, uh, step two is the volunteer application on Better Impact. Uh, Better Impact is our online system that you can use to sign up for a volunteer shift, log volunteer hours, um, and then also submit some observations and data. So how many people did you talk to? Did you see a bunch of dogs running around where they shouldn't be? Um, some of those different things. So um, that, that's, that's a way for you to tell us about what you're seeing on the beach. Um, so you'll, you'll get some more instructions about how to use Better Impact um, after you've created uh, your account. So visit uh, Better Impact, fill out that application. Um, it is the State Parks Volunteer application. Um, so some of the questions probably will not be relevant to this program. Um, feel free to only fill out the, the uh, questions that are required. Don't, you know, you don't have to talk about I think like you, there's space to like list like six references. We we definitely don't need that. Um, don't don't feel like you have to do that. Um, so you can get there um, at either of those links, um, or you can scan that QR code. Um, and again, we'll email all of this out to everybody uh, at the end, uh, so you can you, you'll have all these links and insights. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, wait, what's the difference between this? Is it the same things? Okay. Anyways, so fill out the form, um, fill out that application, um, let us know when you're done, um, and then I will um, I will send you on to the next step, <laughs> um, which is the volunteer, uh, long-term volunteer paperwork packet. So you'll hear this term long-term volunteer thrown around a lot. Uh, we call it LTVs, um, but it's it's sort of a, a, um, a, a special uh, volunteer status, I guess, within within the state park system. So these long-term volunteers are technically anybody who has volunteered more than three times is supposed to register as a long-term volunteer. Often that's not how it works out in practice. Um, but long-term volunteers um, are supposed to complete the paperwork packet in a live scan, um, some additional online trainings like that COVID one I mentioned. Um, you're eligible to work kind of independently. So you can go out on the beach and, and represent yourself as a state parks volunteer. Um, without sort of direct supervision. 
Um, you're responsible for logging your, your hours and the better impact. Um, and you're also, you're eligible to earn um, a, a Monterey District Day Use Pass. So if you complete, if you do 50 hours of volunteering um, in the State Park uh, Monterey District, or actually I think across the State Park system, um, you can earn a, a, day, a day use pass that'll get you into Point Lobos and, and Pfeiffer Big Sur and a lot of those local parks. Um, and if you do 200 hours within a year, um, oops, that should be 2024, um, you can actually get a statewide annual day use pass that'll, that'll work anywhere um, across the state. So that's kind of a, a cool uh, benefit to, to volunteering as a long-term volunteer. Um, <clears throat> so what's, what's in this paperwork packet? I'm not gonna read through all these, but that's a whole bunch of forms. Um, <laughs> If you have any questions about any of these particular forms, we can talk about it. Um, but you know, they've all got designations, um, a volunteer service agreement, a visual media consent. Um, we've got a duty statement special for the political guardian. So that'll sort of outline the, the kind of tasks that you'll um, you know, be, would be asked to do. Um, and then uh, of course, we've got also sort of the, the, the paper packet. So those other ones are in DocuSign, uh, but we do have a form that goes with a long uh, live scan. Um, as well as the DPR 883, um, those ones have to be done um, in by paper. I, we don't have that in DocuSign. Um, and then again, I put in another plug, please do the survey, um, even if you're not necessarily interested in, in uh, joining the Plover Guardian program, it does help us to, to kind of understand. <clears throat> okay, um, once you've done all those things, uh, go ahead and email us your completed paperwork packet, um, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there to the next step, which is, getting a live scan background check. Um, we will send you a, a unique form with a unique number um, and you, you'll take that live scan request form into a uh, live scan place where, where they can do a live scan um, fingerprinting. Um, it usually costs about $30, uh, but if you save your receipt and send in uh, the form, um, you can get reimbursed. It takes uh, about a month, unfortunately, to go through, um, but it does go through. so. Uh, do save your receipt. Um, there are lots of places around here where you can get a live scan done uh, at the UPS store, uh, for example. Um, but if you go to the State of California Department of Justice website, um, you can you can go and search by county, like where can I get a live scan? Um, and then you can actually see like when they're available and um, you know how much they cost. Some of them are, are cheaper than others. Um, so that's I recommend uh, checking that that website out. Um, while you're waiting for your live scan to process, um, we've got two kind of online uh, trainings that are required. One is called the Bear in Mind online training. So any long-term volunteer in the California State Park System is supposed to do this training uh, every two years. Uh, you can complete it online through Better Impact. So once you've created that account, you should be able to access it. Um, and again, I'll send you all of the details about how to do all these things um, after this training, but I just want to kind of give you the overview of, of what these things are. Oh, and this is a, it's a social awareness training uh, that was created by our, our human rights office. Um, I have to do that one too. Um, okay, and then this one that is new this year, um, it is a, a, a kind of a, a required from Cal OSHA training. You only have to do it one time um, and it takes about 15, 20 minutes um, and it's it's basically kind of letting you know about um, your uh, kind of the non-emergency standards for COVID um, that have, have gone into effect, I think maybe this month. Um, after all of that paperwork and stuff, we'll have our in-person training, uh, which is always fun to, to kind of get everybody together. Um, well, it gives volunteers a chance to receive equipment. Um, learn some of the relevant regulations, some messaging strategies for talking to the public, um, meeting other Plover guardians. Uh, we practice with each other, kind of approaching, you know, talking, having some of these conversations, uh, but we also try to um, get out to the beach if we can um, and, and actually practice approaching the public for real. Um, and of course, asking questions um, of, of, of us, State Parks folks um, and, and Amanda and um, each other too. So we'll have our experienced Plover Guardians will be there too. And we've got two dates. Um, one is Saturday, March 16th, and one is Friday, March 22nd. We tried to pick a weekday and a weekend um, and we'll, they'll both be at 2 p.m. Um, you don't have to go to both, you just have to go to one um, and they'll be at the Marina State Beach office, um, which if you know where Marina State Beach is, there's a little state parks office way down at the end of, of Reservation Road in Marina. But again, we'll send you all the details um, after this training. 
Um, I mentioned equipment. Um, we do have a, uh, a limited number of these cool snowy plover guardian uh, like windbreakers, um, but everybody will get a at least a very minimum, uh, a name tag and a patch. Uh, and hopefully we've also, we've got some hats, um, some vests out there too. Um, we've got some cheat sheet information. So you don't have to like memorize all of this stuff about snowy plovers and, and regulations. And um, we've got a lot of that written up for you so that you can, you know, uh, reference that if you'd like, um, including best practices, important phone numbers. Um, you know, if you're ever in, in uh, see something dangerous, please call 911. Um, but for less non-emergency things, we've, we've got other phone numbers on there too, such as what happens if a, a sea lion washes up on the beach. We'll talk about all that, those stuff um, at this, this training. Um, and then, you know, talking too about some of this, this equipment for engaging the public. So we've got snowy plover pamphlets, we've got coloring sheets, we've got all kinds of fun, fun things that you can give out to the public. Um, okay, step seven, <laughs> if you're keeping track, is the plover expert shadowing. Um, so we'll, we'll try to get you signed up to visit a site uh, with a plover expert. Uh, so the idea is to kind of get you off um, on the right foot, starting the season with confidence, hopefully getting to go out with a scope, seeing some birds in the wild is always really fun. Um, you know, practice speaking with the public, asking questions from, from folks who have been at this for, for many years. Um, and these we'll, we'll schedule these probably kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, with people. So depending on who our, our pool of experts are this year and then how many people we have that, that would like to go out, um, we'll, we'll schedule these. But the goal is to try to do it kind of early in the season. So late March, early April, April is the idea. Okay, um, and finally, this is sort of just my, my little summary slide here. Um, I think I'll probably leave it here because this has uh, pretty much everything you need to know. Um, <laughs> Um, good job. You've attended, officially attended the virtual kickoff meeting, online training. Um, next steps are all laid out there, but it starts with the, um, the pre-program -pro survey, pre-season survey. Uh, so you can click on that link. Um, I think it's in the chat. You can scan it with your phone, uh, however you'd like to do it. And the next step after that is the better impact application. So those are both things that you could do tonight if you'd like to. Um, you could do them right now, uh, which would be great. Uh, but please, please uh, stay in touch, uh, you know, email us if you have any questions about any of this, because I know there's a lot of information in there. Um, and then two, uh, go ahead and, and take a look at your calendar and, and uh, see about uh, trying to join us for, for one of those in-person trainings. All right, any, any questions on all of that, which I know there's a lot there, but. <laughs> That's great, thank you so much, Sam. I did add that link to the, the pre-season survey um, it's a Google form. It's in the chat. If you have to scroll up just a little bit now, um, we've had some good conversations since then, but yeah, that's in the chat. If you guys want to go ahead and do that, you sure can. I also just barely uploaded as we were doing this. Um, there's a lot of good information on our Monterey Audubon webpage, yes. but it might be confusing when you start out because it's just the shorebird program, which is black oyster catchers and snowy plovers. And you have to scroll past the oyster catchers to get to plover. So O is before P. Um, that, I, do not, I don't value one over the other. I love them both <laughs> equally. Um, but I uploaded Sam's slides there. So all those links he was talking about is in those PDF slides, which are linked on that page. That's also where the uh, recording of this video will be linked. So um, it's a good resource, I would say. And certainly for um, if you want to learn about oyster catcher stuff, there's a lot on there about oyster catchers. But um, yeah, any other any other questions? We're, we ended a little bit early. Yay, us. Um, oh, Lisa's got um, in the chat, what steps will returning volunteers need to complete? Good question, Lisa. I think Let's see. Let, let me let Sam answer because I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that is a great question. So um, you've already signed up through Better Impact uh, and filled out all the forms and done the live scan. Um, all you've got to do is um, if you need to complete the online training, so either the bear, bear in mind training or the COVID training, um, you'll have to do those ones. Um, we Yes, we do want you to come in and attend one of those two in-person trainings. Um, and if you would like to do a plover expert shadowing, you're you're welcome to. I don't think it's required your second year, um, but you know it is it is fun. So <laughs> I think it's fun um, to get to see the birds and things. So um, I would recommend you do that, but you you are not uh, don't have to. Oh, but please do the the survey, even if you are returning. All right. I think, uh, maybe Patricia had her hand up. Did I see that? 
Yeah, uh, this might be the same Patricia in the chat room. If yeah, I, I put it in okay. the chat. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So uh, Patricia was asking, how long is a shift? Is it mostly walking the beach to talk to people? Ah, great question. Okay, so um, in the past, it has been mostly walking the beach uh, to talk to people. Uh, but now we are, um, we have put together a tabling kit, um, which you can check out and pick up from our office. And if you would prefer to set up at a parking lot, um, it'll have kind of, uh, hopefully, I think it's going to be a table and a chair and um, all kinds of fun goodies, uh, little displays. Um, there's a, a really cool, like, little build your own snowy plover nest, uh, like, I don't know how you describe it thing. That's really neat. Um, it's a lot of fun. A little activity. Yeah. So we're, we're hopefully we'll have that together in time for um, our in-person training so we can kind of talk about that process. Yeah. Um, as far as how long are our shifts, um, totally flexible. So we sort of what we've done in the past is uh, folks can sign up for a morning or an afternoon, um, but it's not it's not like you have to be out there all morning or you have to be out there all noon um, all afternoon. Um, that's just mostly to kind of let other people know when you might be out at the beach. Um, I think often people are out there for an hour or two. Um, you know, I think I've seen somebody who's gone out in like two and a half hour chunks. Um, so it's it's really um, there's a lot of flexibility with that. Um, we do. I, I can't remember. Oh, gosh, I should know this off the top of my head. I believe um, our, our hope is is for folks to put in uh, like five to six hours a month. Um, but that is not a, a hard and fast um, kind of rule. Um, that's mostly we want you to be able to get a, um, a district pass at the end of the year. <laughs> and I think if you do that, you, you should be able to, to get one of those uh, those park passes. Good question. And then Emily's, yeah, kind of uh, related to that. Emily was asking, is there a minimum volunteer hour requirement? I think you covered that. And then she was also asking, are most shifts done as singletons or is it common for shifts to go with other folks? And and you can go out solo if you like. Um, we do really encourage people to go with a buddy. There's certainly locations where it helps to have someone either like at a trailhead, like I'm thinking at... Um, the seaside entrance to Monterey State Beach, which is that one by the Tides Hotel. It's kind of handy to have someone kind of like kind of patrolling the parking lot, getting people before they get, you know, way down on the beach and just saying, hey, if you go south of the Tides Hotel, just up that sidewalk up to where the Roberts Beach access is, you can have your dog down there, no problem. But if you go north of here, they're not allowed. And then someone could be down on the beach kind of intercepting people down there. So it's nice to have a buddy. Safety wise, it's a really good idea. Um, kind of helpful for, you know, uh, divide and conquer <laughs> on the beach. Um, but it's not required. But we do hope, especially in our in-person trainings, that people will kind of find somebody who might have a similar schedule or you could carpool. You both live in the same dorms or the same city. Um, and could go out together. I think that would be a really good strategy, but you could do either whatever works best for you. Yeah, good, good point. And I forgot to mention too, in that pre-season uh, survey, one of the questions we ask is sort of, what's your general availability? Um, and then what we'll do is we'll take some of that information and we'll have it at the in-person trainings and we can say, look, here's somebody who maybe their schedule aligns with you. Um, but we'll also, you know, if, if people are saying, hey, I really want a buddy, um, we'll, we'll, try and, and get um, you paired up with somebody else who's who's interested in that. Patricia had a good follow-up question. She was asking, can my buddy be a, a non-state parks volunteer or would that be discouraged? Um, I don't know if I could say one way or the other. I'm sure like logistically or legally, maybe they should be a state parks volunteer. But theoretically, I guess it's like, we're just both walking on the same day and you just wanted to have you know, a buddy, a backup person, kind of, in case of emergency, and they aren't having to, you know, patrol separately from you. Um, I think that would be reasonable, but happy to hear Sam and Esther's point on that. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so I think if it's going to be sort of a regular um, thing, if they, if they want to go out, um, you know, um, often with you, um, it would be better to have them signed up um, as a volunteer. Um, because there's a lot of, you know, training and stuff that goes in, in with this. But if someone just says, hey, I want to go out on the beach and, and see what you're up to, um, you know, you're welcome to bring somebody along. Um, absolutely. That way, if they're signed up, they also get the benefits of being a volunteer and getting volunteer hours. So, yeah. Great. Any other last questions? Yeah, feel free to either um, put it in the chat, or if you want to raise your hand, you sure can. Uh, Laura is asking about, could she get 25 hours um, 
to uh, probably this is probably a service learning question, I imagine. Uh, would I be able to get 25 hours uh, by mid May? You could, find, you could do that. Yeah, so. you I could go out fun. every Saturday morning, walk straight down Second yeah. Street to Fort Ordoon State Beach and hang out for a bit, peddle some brochures. Yeah, and uh, since she's in service learning, I'm thinking she'll be doing um, at least manning one of the chairs for the tabling events. And that could be however long uh, hours wise as you need to get those 25 hours for your service learning class. Yeah, that sounds like a good gig, I think, Laura. Good thinking. Um, Patricia is also asking uh, if I if I miss both uh, in-person trainings, I have to wait until next year if she's not available for those two dates that we gave. Um, I don't know about that one. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, um, go, go ahead and uh, yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, go ahead and send us an email. Um, we we try to a part of the big part of the training is trying to get everybody together um, as much as possible, um, but. We're speaking from past experience. We um, it's hard to get a date that works for everybody, so we kind of ended up picking picking two. But if you're not available in those dates and you still want to participate, um, we can we can definitely make it work. Awesome, Lisa. Thank you so much. We just had uh, Lisa went ahead and was working on that preseason survey, but she said that it's listed that the the in person trainings begin at nine thirty uh, at nine thirty a.m. But yeah, we actually those are going to be starting at two p.m. So that was just a typo. Um, and those are posted on our, our Monterey Audubon Shorebird program page as well. So um, thanks for pointing that out, Lisa. So yeah, don't get confused, everybody. If you see that, um, 2 p.m. start time for those trips. And we'll fix so, that right after this call. <laughs> yeah, we'll get that fixed. So uh, you can reference that later once it's fixed, but it should be 2 p.m. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And um and yeah, like um, like Fred had mentioned, you know, there's a lot of cool shorebirds out on the beach right now, even, and they're gonna a lot of them will be heading out, you know, to go nest elsewhere. The snowy plovers and the black oyster catchers are kind of the only two that stick around and nest on our Monterey beaches. Um, killdeer, which are a type of plover, they're on the CSU and B campus. They're on golf courses. <laughs> they are a shorebird, but man, they just don't <laughs> seem to care about. They don't have the standards that the oyster yeah. catchers and the plovers have. So they're the third shorebird that is not migrating and nests around here. But almost all those others will be heading out. So go out and say, you know, bid adieu to our lovely shorebirds on the beach. And um, uh, yeah, they definitely can benefit from the same messaging that we put out for, um, you know, sensitivity around our nesting shorebirds. Um, you know, uh, the migrating shorebirds also need space to forage and um, and rest and roost. So uh, keep that in mind when you're at the beach, you know, feel free to informally begin your interpretation with your friends and family, perhaps. Um, let's not run through that flock of birds and make them scatter. Um, you know, always good to think about our effect on our our neighbors, be they human or little, little cute critters. So um, yeah, any final questions? I'll stop chattering. Um, but um, yeah, thanks again. You have our emails. You can always get in touch. Um, oh yeah, Lauren's saying she saw a bunch of killdeer at Fort Ord. Yeah, killdeer kind of, they look almost like a snowy plover, a, a little bit more like a semi-palmated plover. They have two black bands across their neck. So we see a very large looking plover with a two black bands and kind of red eyes that look stressed out. That's the killdeer. Yeah. Very loud. Yes, that's right. They could be called the drama plover. That's right. Okay. Well, thanks so much, everybody. I'm glad you stuck through to the bitter end to hear all of our jokes and chit chat. So um, <laughs> I'll go ahead and stop. I'll stop recording so that doesn't get 